We are cooking up some delicious treats today on Building Unbreakable Brands. Our guest is the steward of a premium vanilla extract brand that is over a century old. He'll be sharing his insights on how to make sure a legacy brand stays relevant and strong for many more generations. Plus, Henry joins us as that voice of the next generation, asking questions about what it's like to work with siblings in a family business. All this and more is coming up on this episode of Building Unbreakable Brands. Welcome to Building Unbreakable Brands, the podcast where we talk to business leaders with a generational mindset. I'm Megan Lynch. I'm an advisor to family businesses and founder of Six Point, a brand strategy agency that helps generational brands honor their past while evolving for the future. Today, my guest is Matt Nielsen, third generation steward, shareholder, board director, and managing director Europe of Nielsen Massey Vanillas, a global food flavoring company. Welcome, Matt. So excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Megan. I'm happy to be here. The intro that I just said was one that you actually submitted to us, but you used one word in it that I love, and that word is steward. It's a word that, like, I don't know, I have a lot of feelings about personally, but I'm curious, how do you consider yourself a steward of Nielsen Massey? Yeah, really, it, it comes from a, a couple of different areas. One, we've always talked about our desire to continue to perpetuate our family business and to be able to pass it on to the next generation. So in that sense, we're a steward of the company, right? It's not just ours. It's previous generations, it's future generations, we hope. And so that's where that word comes from. And then there actually was another family. I didn't used to use it as a description. Like I used to talk about being a steward, but I didn't really use it as like a title description. And there was another actually non-family executive who used that word. And he was very passionate about how he was a steward for the family's business. And it just really connected with me. And I decided that, yeah, I need to include that because I talk about being a steward, but I don't really use it as a as a descriptor of who I am. And it is really who I am. Yeah. Why do you think it's important to make that distinction between stewardship and and maybe ownership or other words that people might use to describe themselves? Yeah, I think it just has a different mindset when you are When you're focused on taking care of whatever it is, an entity in this situation, it gives you a different mindset when you are thinking about it for future generations. And within our business, we have with our board and our non-family executives, we have a G6 kind of strategy. So meaning that everything we do, we are looking out generations ahead of ourselves to a generation where I won't even be here, most likely. Um, And so... Just that that belief that you have to have this long term view and you have to have this care for what you're doing. And that's what then influences the governance decisions you make and what you invest in from the business standpoint and how you spend the money and things like that. Right. It's it all just comes down to that stewardship. Mm. Now, the company's been around for over 100 years since the early 1900s. And you've pretty much been focused through the whole time in flavoring, like maybe not exactly the the iteration that you guys have now of being really focused on like vanilla extract, but but it's been pretty consistent through the whole history of the company, which also feels a little bit unusual. So I'm curious, is there anything about what the history of the company and how that plays into this concept or the the longevity that you see coming forward or that focus? Yeah, we have evolved a bit in our industry, in our, in our business. And we started as actually an aroma company and then we evolved and shifted pretty early on into food flavorings. And we used to do all kinds of flavorings, artificials and naturals and all that kind of stuff. And my dad actually made the decision around 1979 to focus just on pure vanilla. It was really what we were known for. It was the biggest part of our revenue was driven by vanilla. And so we did that for a long time. And then we actually, in the early 2000s, came back and reintroduced some of the flavors that we used to do to to broaden our product portfolio. But I think for us, obviously, it's what we've grown up in. And it's what we're really good at also. You have to recognize what you're really good at. And the other 
benefit to it and and why we haven't shifted i talked when i talk about our family business and kind of what our strategy is evolving and we look at broadening uh, and diversifying what we do but i say i use the example we're not going to go into it to be a trucking company right that's just not a core strength of what we do we don't do fulfillment like that but food and flavorings is what we do as our core strength. And we're lucky in that category within the industry is a real strength because ultimately everybody's got to eat and and their food's got to taste good and, and we can do that for them. Yeah, that's great. As you think about keeping the company strong and being able, having that G6 mentality, do you see the these core competencies that you're building and strengthening now, do you see them as being flexible to be able to like pivot into other areas as the industry evolves? Yeah, definitely. And there's with the connections we have, particularly with chefs in the food service industry, and then also the food manufacturers that we sell with and the retailers that we sell to, there's a lot of different opportunities that we could look at as we continue to grow and evolve the business. And there's strengths that we have in, say, for example, extraction that could play a part in a lot of different areas that aren't necessarily something that people would think about normally. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what we're working through now is what is the evolution of the business and where do we feel that our strengths and our brand allow us to play in in the future and trying to solve that question. Yeah, yeah. Do you see, knowing that you have a really broad team, not just in the US, a global team. How do you talk about stewardship with people who aren't necessarily in the family or haven't grown up in the business? Are, are, do, do they also consider themselves stewards of the company? You mentioned somebody else using that word. So it, there's at least a couple other people who are feeling that. Definitely in our leadership team, people will utilize that word or a similar, right, meaning word for sure. And there's no doubt that because of the culture that we have and how we're so focused on family in a broader sense, meaning all of our team members we consider to be part of our family, not just the nuclear family, there's definitely that sense of pride and ownership among our team. And it's really what allows us to continue to be the brand that we are and produce the quality of products that we do offer in the marketplace. So it's a huge part of what we do. And we certainly, as family owners, we certainly talk about that as it relates to our values and things with our team members, but also even people outside of the business with prospective customers and current customers. Um, and stewardship also plays a big part in, in our supply chain as well. We source raw materials from developing countries that don't have access to everything that we're accustomed to here. And so we do a lot to help support those farmers um, with things like clean water and education and better transportation and things like that. And that also plays a stewardship role as well, that these are other people that are connected with us and can benefit from our relationship. And so we feel that 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 bond with them that we get from that stewardship. Hmm. I would imagine that also plays into that long term mentality of if we want to be in this in the generations to come, then we need a supply chain that's strong. We need an environment that can, especially dealing with a natural product like vanilla, you need a healthy environment. You need the ecosystem that you're working within in a lot of ways to be to also endure, <laughs> you yeah. know, that it's not just about your company, but it's about everything that touches it and that it plays into. Do you guys have conversations about those longer term issues and how you touch them? I know you're also only one small piece of this ecosystem, what influence you can have on it. 
Yeah, no, most definitely. The sustainability, both economically, agriculturally, environmentally, right? Like all those things are super important to us. And we were actually one of the founding members of an organization called the Sustainable Vanilla Initiative. My brother actually sits on the, and so that's a collection of manufacturers like us and users. So people that are buying the product to use and produce in something that they're making, as well as growers and exporters in in Madagascar. Madagascar. And it's really just focused on how can we make this supply chain better and how can we make it better for the growers? How can we make it better for the exporters? And then and then how does that translate into companies like ours being able to attain the quality that we want at a sustainable price as well? And then that's super critical for the for the marketplace as a whole. You're listening to Building Unbreakable Brands, the podcast all about brand stewardship and crafting an enduring legacy. I'm here with Matt Nielsen, Board Director and Managing Director Europe of Nielsen Massey Vanillas. Matt is also an advocate for family businesses. So Matt, I've, I've heard you speak at family business conferences. We've been, I feel like I know you better than I probably do for some reason. I don't know why. But I know that when you speak at family business conferences or you get interviewed, it's often around governance, which is not a... <laughs> It's not a super interesting topic because it's really about the structure of the business. But I think one of the reasons why that tends to be a topic that you're asked to talk about is that Nielsen Massey has a somewhat unusual structure for a family business and a family business of your size with an, both an independent board of directors and then also uh, you appointed a non-family CEO, both of which are like unusual moves. I'm curious first, like, why do you think this kind of structure is uncommon? Yeah, I think for a lot of family businesses, they struggle with really what it comes down to is giving up con- what they feel is control, mm-hmm. right? So by having an independent board, they feel like they're giving up control over the strategic direction of the company and even some of the decision making. And then certainly with a non-family CEO, they feel like they're giving up that day-to-day decision making. And I think part of what makes my story interesting is the journey that we took to get there, but also the fact that I can be a living example that is the furthest thing from the truth. Mm -hmm. So how does, I think, that piece of control when you're, especially when you're trying to build something that will last and endure, holding it tighter can be a way to hope to make it feel like, ooh, if I keep control of this, then that will help ensure its longevity. But it seems like you guys are you're thinking longevity, but this has become part of the strategy for longevity. So how do those two pieces work together? Yeah, completely. And I think I would challenge that mentality by holding it tighter, meaning keeping that circle of who's involved with it smaller, I would suggest is a risk because if it, if for our business, if it came down to say my brother and I, and then my sister, who are the current shareholders, we predominantly know the Nielsen Massey way of doing things. And what we did a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, doesn't necessarily apply to the future. Mm-hmm. So we want to be challenged as shareholders by the board of directors and by the non-family management on how we think about things and how we look to the future of the business. And it also helps open our eyes to the possibilities, right? Our board, I, I still remember early on with our independent board, them coming in and being so excited to share their expertise with us and knowing that our focus was on growing this business to be able to perpetuate it to the next generation. And honestly, they came in with all kinds of ideas, right? About, did you think about this? Have you thought about this? Your brand is this. And help us kind of frame what that future can look like differently than we might have been thinking. And I think our mindset was much more conservative than where they can push us to to think a little bit more outside of the box. And I think that's really been one of the key benefits of the independent board and the non-family CEO and, and management that are involved with our organizations. I remember you saying at one point that you were a little bit surprised at 
the caliber of people who wanted to help your family and your company. Do you think that's also a piece of why maybe other companies don't go here sooner? Is it like, who would we get? Who would care? It's just our little corner of the world. Yeah, I certainly think that could be in the mind of people for sure. But I would suggest even with the caliber of the people that we got being so great and we utilized outside resources to help find those people. So I would certainly recommend that. But I think people will be surprised at those that want to help them and that are just interested in sharing their experiences and their expertise to help family owners and businesses develop their strategy for the future. It's something I enjoy doing and I've been involved with board work as well um, outside of our business, but certainly within our business, obviously that's you know what I get up for every day is to think about the future of our business. But, but I think, yeah, I think people will be surprised at the quality of the individuals that will be interested in helping them, the diversity of the people as well, which is super critical to opening up everybody's eyes to other possibilities based on their experience experiences. So it's it's been a really fun journey. Hmm. Has there been anything in particular kind of looking back that you feel like was a real lesson learned or like learning moment for you or for your family in the, the process? Yeah, I think probably one of the most and this might be one of those kind of dumb moments per se. But one of the things that the board challenged us on early was for us to be able to articulate what our shareholder vision was separate from what the corporate vision is. Right. This is the vision of the shareholders. And what are our goals as shareholders for the future of the business? And I think for us, it was just a matter that there were three of us. We were all engaged in the day to day of the business. We were all on the board. So there was a lot of communication and and face to face time among the three of us. So we all knew that. But for us to, to actually sit down and and put it to words was a really interesting process to go through and helped provide clarity for us, certainly as shareholders, and as well to see that we were aligned on what that was. But ultimately, what's most important was is it gave the board and therefore the management team that North Star of what they needed to be looking at for the future mm. so that they could develop the strategies and the operational plans to attain that kind of vision. Yeah, I do feel like it is one of those steps that is so easy to skip, number one, because you are, everybody's just working so hard in the day. And it can also feel, I feel like sometimes you can do those like visioning things and it's, are we just wordsmithing here? Does this really mean anything? But I do Mm -hmm. feel like when you can get it right and you really do get to the essence of where you want to go and you can articulate that, it is that North Star that turns a bunch of people who are all have great skills, but would otherwise be wandering (laughs) around doing the best that they can, but not necessarily going in the direction to actually saying, okay, this is a mountain we can climb, we can help do this, and we can put our skills to use. I think that's really interesting. And to do it specifically from the viewpoint of shareholders versus the company must have been a really interesting piece. Yeah. Was there anything, (laughs) any like, theme that came out of that for you guys that your you and your siblings were all saying the same thing in different words or yeah i think probably one of the biggest things that came out as i said before we're very focused on quality of our product and the culture of our business and things like that so that's certainly a part of our vision but i think the big thing that really came out that opened the eyes of the board and the management team was our desire to diversify our business. We are a food flavoring company, but within that food flavoring portfolio, we are very reliant on vanilla as a single ingredient. And there's inherent risk to that. So we have a tremendous amount of of interest in diversifying both the product portfolio as well as maybe even the holdings of the of the corporation to help alleviate some of that reliance just on one class of product. And that like I said, I think that was really eye-opening for the board and the management team and, and 
did provide a kind of a shift, right, in how people were thinking. And therefore, we need to start thinking a little differently on how we're going to be doing some of these things. And and maybe when product innovation, we're not going to just talk about innovating vanilla. Maybe we're going to start talking about innovating other things or going through and doing acquisitions and things like that. So it, it definitely opened up people's minds to other possibilities. Mm. When you're talking about that kind of diversification for a company that is very focused, which can be a strength, how do you put appropriate guardrails on that to make sure that people don't hear that and all of a sudden go way out into left field? Go buy a trucking company, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're still doing that, to be honest. We're, we're putting those parameters in place. But I think the team recognizes that we have a core strength in ingredients, first off, and that we're able to get a lot of market knowledge and insights, particularly from the chef connections that we have on really what it comes down to is what can we do to help fill a need or a pain point for somebody? So whether that's a different ingredient, a different format of an ingredient, a different packaging, whatever it may be, that's ultimately, I think, what's going to be successful for us. But it's also looking at, we do look at and say, we're not going to go too far outside of our, our space. As a retail, as a CPG retail focused company, for one of our channels, I can look at the baking aisle and say, okay, what else is in the baking aisle that either is an interesting brand to acquire or some, or a category that we could get into so that we're still talking to the same buyer. So we're not shifting to a whole, we're not doing a frozen product that has a whole different buyer that also has a distribution channel that we don't even know. So it's those kinds of things. And then, and working with exports to help us kind of frame what that looks like and, and what those parameters are so that we're not getting ourselves distracted by something that really doesn't fit our our corporate culture. You're listening to Building Unbreakable Brands, the podcast all about brand stewardship and crafting an enduring legacy. I'm here with my guest, Matt Nielsen, third generation steward, shareholder, board director, and managing director Europe of Nielsen Massey Vanillas, a global food flavoring company. So, Matt, I have a feeling that one of the reasons why I feel like I know you so is that I feel like we both share a love of learning, (laughs) that we tend to run up against each other in conferences or I see you posting things on LinkedIn or getting involved in and this kind of like love of learning and love of evolving and really continuously rethinking is this is how we're doing it now going to serve us in the future. I see it as a strength because I love to do the same thing. But I'm curious if you ever think that can be a weakness, learning and evolving. And I don't think of it as a weakness. I think, you know, I'm super passionate about it and I'm, I'm addicted to learning. And learning's not just from reading a book or from taking a class. It's from the people you meet and the shared experiences that you have and how you can, you know, share what your best practices are. So I love that kind of network, particularly within family businesses of how people are, are looking to share. Um And I'm also an individual that kind of hates to feel like I'm on a plateau. So that evolution is really important to me to, I don't feel like I am the smartest person in the room um, and I don't feel like I know everything. So I'm still striving to continue to develop areas that I think I need to develop in. But I think where it can become a weakness in the distraction that it could provide, right? So it would be very easy for me to just constantly go to conferences and go to, there's enough within our family business kind of area that I could literally go to a conference probably almost every week or go to some educational institution and take a class almost every week. But I have a full time job also. Right. And a family. So that's not that's just not in the realm of possibilities. So I think it's important to if you're going to go down that road, which I highly recommend for everybody, because nobody knows everything and everybody still has things that I think that they need to to work on. And having that curiosity, I think, is is super critical. But just making sure that you prioritize, right? What areas you want to focus on and try not to go overboard on it. 
because you, you can get into a almost a paralysis as well. So it's there's the distraction, but there's also this kind of paralysis that if you get so focused on one thing and then you just you can't move because of it. Mm. Yeah. And I think that, again, when you surround yourself with, you know, smart people with great ideas, I I guess I'll speak for myself. So I, I feel like sometimes I can almost lose myself in it. I'm like, ooh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And then all of a sudden I have to come back to, oh, what am I trying? It goes back to that kind of North Star. What am I trying to do yeah. with this information? Where is this going? Because it can be so easy to just, oh, you're smart. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that. yeah, <laughs> that's very true. When it comes to leadership and business, you, you mentioned that it's not all books that there's like this kind of networking human aspect like how do you like to learn and develop yourself or or how do you like to come up with ways to evolve either yourself as a leader or the company yeah i'm a very experiential learner so i like to go out and and actually see things one of my favorite things to do is to go see customers factories or just go to other factories because i love to see how things are made right that's my curiosity is to know how that's made. There's also things I can learn from that I can take back to our team and say, I saw this company, they were doing this in this way. That was really interesting. Maybe we should think about something like that. But so there's definitely things to learn that way, but experiential and and then just having conversations. I'm not so much a book learner. I can sit and read books and I like to read, but um, usually I like to read to distract myself from work as opposed to reading for work and just because I have limited time to be able to do that. But so for me, it's really that hands on and that talking back and forth and, and gaining inspiration from what others have experienced and, and accomplished is what drives me. Mm-hmm. Do you have an example or a story of an experience that you had that kind of changed the way you were thinking about something? That's a really good question. Put me on the spot there. Um <laughs> It's easy to think about if I didn't ask the question. It would have been. I think, let's see, there's a few examples that, that come to mind. I think one of the things that stands out for me and in, in, in an area that we were struggling with as a sibling kind of leadership team was how do we best manage that dynamic of being siblings and being leaders in the business together? And I had the opportunity through an educational connection I had made to go speak to a team of brothers, three brothers that were running their family business together. And they all had very distinct kind of areas of focus that they were working on, as did my siblings and I. But they also, I think what opened my eyes is a bit as they were closer in age than my siblings and I are. So they had a lot more shared experiences together than my siblings and I had, right? So the relationship dynamics were much different among the three of them than they were with the three of us. And I could see how that could create some challenges for our sibling group uh, in having a shared, shared, uh, excuse me, and having a shared leadership model like we did. And that's part of what drove us to looking for a non-family CEO to come and and run the business for us. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So seeing that kind of an alternative relationship and then reflecting on, oh, what's the same about our relationship and then what's different and seeing some of those differences. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there anything that you're like really into right now in particular that you're learning about or curious about a lot of my focus right now in an in relation to family business is is thinking about how to orientate or or onboard the next generation Mm -hmm. so we have a pretty diverse range of ages right now from one year old up to 32 year old in our next generation and i think it's really critical that we make sure that we don't just let one family of the kind of the three branches that we are now that we don't let people just do that on their own without some structure, just because it's hard to know. I have the youngest kids and it's hard for me to think through and figure out like, what am I going to teach them about the business at what age, right? So what I teach them at five is going to be different than I'm teaching them at 13 and 18 and 22 and trying to think through that and see if there's a way to put some structure behind that kind of of a program that will help 
the next gen recognize that being part of the family and being part of a family business isn't just employment in the business. And particularly as we get bigger as a family, that's not always going to be possible as well, potentially, and that there's a lot of different ways that they can engage with the family and the family business and the different entities that we have in addition to employment. But I think that all starts with kind of education, again, on the business, on family business in general, I think, obviously, and then obviously our business as well as to what makes our business unique and the channels that we sell into and the customers types that we have and things like that. But I'm not exactly sure when when I start those conversations with my kids. And that's why I'd like to to put some structure there. Yeah. How old are your kids? I have a one year old and a 10 year old. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then we also have a, a 16 year old and a 28 and a 32 year old in, in all on that fourth in generation. That generation. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's fun. When it and there's, that. yeah. And there's two fifth generations that are older than my one year old. So that are close in age, but older. So there's going to be a lot of that needs to happen around family business and our business with those generations. Yeah. Does your 10 year old is at all interested in what you do or? Um, I think he's intrigued by it. He understands things. I think he sometimes gets embarrassed by some of the things that I might talk about or or the fact that I'll point out to him a particular product that carry that has our vanilla in it as an ingredient and and that if we're at the grocery store, I might tell him, no, sorry, we can't buy that product because it doesn't have daddy's vanilla. Um, but this product does, so let's buy that one. But he's also done he's done some fun things where we've been in a retailer and when I go into a retail, I have a tendency to be pretty low key. I don't like walk in and tell them that I'm Matt Nielsen from Nielsen Massey and But I like to walk around and see what they're selling and see our product on shelf. And we were in a specialty food retailer and and my son found our product on shelf and picked it up and yelled across the store. Dad, they have your vanilla and really embarrassed me. But, But it was a cute, but it was also a cute moment. And I think there was a sense of pride for him also that, look, Dad, this is, they have yours right here and they're selling it. So I think that's important also. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also really important for a 10-year-old to still be able to embarrass his dad instead of vice versa. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly right. You're listening to Building Unbreakable Brands, the podcast for leaders with a generational mindset. My guest is Matt Nielsen, whose family company, Nielsen Massey Vanilla, produces the world's number one flavor, vanilla, that goes into ice cream, cookies, cakes, and chocolate. Before we wrap up, Matt, we are going to actually turn the mic over to the next generation. My son, Henry, who's eight, has a couple of questions for you. Going to turn it over to him. Take it away, Henry. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Hi, Matt. What's your favorite thing to make with vanilla? Ooh, Henry, that's a great question. That's pretty hard for me to say because I like to use vanilla in a lot of things, but... I think my one of my passions is actually barbecue and it's possible I won't confirm or deny, but it's possible I might use vanilla in my barbecue sauce. Ooh, that feels a little family secret or something. You just (laughs) is it hard to work with your brother and sister? Henry, I will say that working with your brother and sister is both rewarding and challenging. It's great to be able to have people that I can trust and rely on that are family, but it's also hard when you remember something that your brother did to you when you were eight years old and you still hold a grudge against him. And and I can't say that somehow doesn't come up in, in dynamics of decision making or family and things like that. But I think for me, Working with your family is more rewarding than the challenges. And as long as you have the right governance structures in place and the right mentality, you can overcome those challenges and be successful. Thanks, Matt. I also have a joke for you. What's Dracula's favorite ice cream flavor? Vain Ella. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I'm going to have to share that with my son. That was just for you. Thanks so much, Henry. (laughs) And thank you so much for being on Building Unbreakable Brands, Matt. Really enjoyed having you on and appreciate all of the wisdom stories you were able to share and just your mindset of not only 
being a steward and kind of thinking long term, but also really being willing to continue to like learn, be curious, reinvent when needed. I think listeners are going to take a lot from this conversation. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Megan. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share. It was such a great conversation. And I look forward to seeing you at, a, at another conference. Absolutely. If people want to connect with you or they want to learn more about Nielsen Massey, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, probably the best way to connect with me would be on LinkedIn. So just search Matt Nielsen and, and look for that steward of, of family business kind of tagline. Um, and then with Nielsen Massey Vanellas, we're on all kinds of socials, Instagram, Facebook, X, X now, and things like that, as well as on LinkedIn. So please do check us out and give us a follow and engage with us. We love to hear from consumers and, and such about how they're using our products. Yeah. And so we'll link all those in the show notes and people should definitely try your vanilla. It is amazing. And yeah, add it to their favorite ice cream flavor, their barbecue sauce, whatever they can. So thank you Anything so much. And everything. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you, Megan. Matt is such an enthusiastic advocate for family businesses, and I think a real role model when it comes to what curiosity and a willingness to evolve can do to ensuring the longevity of your business. Plus, you'll notice that Nielsen Massey has been able to evolve and grow for more than a century while still staying laser focused because they continue to make it a point to reflect and articulate their vision and goals. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to share it and don't forget to rate us and leave us a review. Thank you so much for listening to Building Unbreakable Brands.